The Making of a Saint, Somerset Maugham's classic second novel, Part 4, 14. I went to the Moratini Palace and with beating heart looked round for Julia. She was surrounded by her usual court and seemed more lively and excited than ever. I had never seen her more beautiful. She was dressed all in white, and her sleeves were sewn with pearls. She looked like a bride. She caught sight of me at once, but pretended not to see me, and went on talking. I approached her brother Alessandro and said to him casually, I am told a cousin of your sister has come to Forley. Is he here today? He looked at me inquiringly, not immediately understanding. Giorgio Dal Aisti, I explained. Oh, I didn't know you meant him. No, he's not here. He and Julia's husband were not friends, and so... Why were they not friends? I interrupted on the spur of the moment, not seeing the impertinence of the question till I had made it. Oh, I don't know. Relations always are at enmity with one another, probably some disagreement with regard to their estates. Was that all? So far as I know. I recollected that in a scandal the persons most interested are the last to hear it. The husband hears nothing of his wife's treachery till all the town knows every detail. I should like to have seen him, I went on. Jorgo! Oh, he's a weak sort of creature, one of those men who commit sins and repent. And that is not a fault of which you will ever be guilty, Alessandro, I said, smiling. I sincerely hope not. After all, if a man has a conscience, he ought not to do wrong. But if he does, he must be a very poor sort of a fool to repent. You cannot have the rose without the thorn. Why not? It only needs care. There are dregs at the bottom of every cup, but you are not obliged to drink them. You have made up your mind that if you commit sins, you are ready to go to hell for them. I said, it is braver than going to heaven by the back door, turning pious when you are too old to do anything you shouldn't. I agree with you that one has little respect for the man who turns monk when things go wrong with him. I saw that Julia was alone, and seized the opportunity to speak with her. Julia, I said, approaching. Ah, she looked at me for a moment with an air of perplexity, as if she really could not remember whom I was. Ah, Messer Filippo, she said, as if suddenly recollecting. It is not so long since we met that you can have forgotten me. Yes, I remember last time you did me the honour to visit me, you were very rude and cross. I looked at her silently, wondering. Well, she said, steadily answering my gaze and smiling. Have you nothing more to say to me than that? I asked in an undertone. What do you want me to say to you? Are you quite heartless? She gave a sigh of boredom and looked to the other end of the room, as if for someone to come and break a tedious conversation. How could you? I whispered. Notwithstanding her self-control, a faint blush came over her face. I stood looking at her for a little while, and then I turned away. She was quite heartless. I left the Moratini and walked out into the town. This last interview had helped me in so far that it made certain that my love was hopeless. I stood still and stamped on the ground, vowing I would not love her. I would put her away from my thoughts entirely. She was a contemptible, vicious woman, and I was too proud to be subject to her. I wondered I did not kill her. I made up my mind to take my courage in both hands and leave Forley. Once away I should find myself attracted to different matters, and probably I should not live long before finding some other woman to take Julia's place. She was not the only woman in Italy. She was not the most beautiful, nor the cleverest. Give me a month, and I could laugh at my torments. The same evening I told Matteo I meant to leave Forley. Why? he asked in astonishment. I have been here several weeks, I answered. I don't want to outstay my welcome. That is rubbish. You know I should be only too glad for you to stay here all your life. That is very kind of you, I replied with a laugh, but the establishment is not yours. That makes no difference. Besides, Checo has become very fond of you, and I'm sure he wishes you to stay. 
Of course, I know your hospitality is quite unlimited, but I'm beginning to want to get back to Città di Castello. Why? asked Matteo, doubtfully. One likes to return to one's native place. You have been away from Castello for ten years. You cannot be in any particular hurry to get back. I was beginning to protest when Cecco came in, and Matteo interrupted me with, Listen, Cecco, Filippo says he wants to leave us. But he shan't, said Cecco, laughing. I really must, I answered gravely. You really mustn't, replied Cecco. We can't spare you, Filippo. There's no great hurry about your going home, he added, when I had explained my reasons. And I fancy that soon we shall want you here. A good sword and a brave heart will probably be of good use to us. Everything is as quiet as a cemetery, I said, shrugging my shoulders. It is quiet above, but below there are rumblings and strange movements. I feel sure this calm only presages a storm. It is impossible for Girolamo to go on as he is now. His debts are increasing every day, and his difficulties will soon be impracticable. He must do something. There is certain to be a disturbance at any attempt to put on the taxes, and then heaven only knows what will happen. I was beginning to get a little vexed at their opposition, and I answered petulantly, No, I must go. Stay another month. Things must come to a head before then. A month would have been as bad as a year. I am out of health, I answered. I feel I want to get into a different atmosphere. Cecco thought for a moment. Very well, he said. We can arrange matters to suit us both. I want someone to go to Florence for me to conclude a little business matter with Messer Lorenzo de' Medici. You would be away a fortnight, and if you are out of sorts the ride across country will put you right. Will you go? I thought for a moment. It was not a very long absence, but the new sights would distract me, and I wanted to see Florence again. On the whole, I thought it would suffice, and that I could count on the cure of my ill before the time was up. Very well, I answered. Good, and you will have a pleasant companion. I had talked to Scipione Moratini about it. It did not occur to me that you would go. But it will be all the better to have two of you. If I go, I said, I shall go alone. Cecco was rather astonished. Why? Scipione bores me. I want to be quiet and do as I like. I was quite determined that neither of the Moratini should come with me. They would have reminded me too much of what I wanted to forget. As you like, said Cecco. I can easily tell Scipione that I want him to do something else for me. Thanks. When will you start? At once. Then come, and I will give you the instructions and necessary papers. Fifteen. Next morning I mounted my horse and set out with Matteo, who was to accompany me for a little way. But at the town gate a guard stopped us and asked where we were going. Out, I answered shortly, moving on. Stop, said the man, catching hold of my bridle. What the devil do you mean, said Matteo. Do you know whom we are? I have orders to let no one go by without the permission of my captain. What tyrants they are, cried Matteo. Well, what the hell are you standing there for? Go and tell your captain to come out. The man signed to another soldier who went into the guardhouse. He was still holding my bridle. I was not very good-tempered that morning. Have the goodness to take your hands off, I said. He looked as if he were about to refuse. Will you do as you are told? Then, as he hesitated, I brought down the butt-end of my whip on his fingers, and with an oath bade him stand off. He let go at once, cursing, and looked as if he would willingly stab me if he dared. We waited impatiently, but the captain did not appear. Why the devil doesn't this man come? I said, and Matteo, turning to one of the soldiers, ordered, Go and tell him to come here instantly. At that moment the captain appeared, and we understood the incident, for it was Ercole Piacentini. He had apparently seen us coming, or heard of my intended journey, and had set himself out to insult us. We were both furious. 
Why the devil don't you hurry up when you're sent for? said Matteo. He scowled but did not answer. Turning to me, he asked, Where are you going? Matteo and I looked at one another in amazement at the man's impudence, and I burst forth, You insolent fellow! What do you mean by stopping me like this? I have a right to refuse passage to anyone I choose. Take care, I said. I swear the Count shall be told of your behaviour, and nowadays the Count is in the habit of doing as the Orsi tell him. He shall hear of this, growled the Piacentini. Tell him what you like. Do you think I care? You can tell him that I consider his captain a very impertinent ruffian. Now let me go. You shall not pass till I choose. By God, man, I said, absolutely beside myself, it seems I cannot touch you here, but if ever we meet in Città di Castello, I will give you any satisfaction you wish, he answered hotly. Satisfaction? I would not soil my sword by crossing it with yours. I was going to say that if ever we meet in Castello, I will have you whipped by my lackeys in the public place. I felt a ferocious pleasure in throwing the words of contempt in his face. Come on, said Matteo, we cannot waste our time here. We put the spurs to our horses. The soldiers looked to their captain to see whether they should stop us, but he gave no order, and we passed through. When we got outside, Matteo said to me, Girolamo must be planning something, or Ercole would not have dared to do that. It is only the impotent anger of a foolish man, I answered. The Count will probably be very angry with him when he hears of it. We rode a few miles, and then Matteo turned back. When I found myself alone, I heaved a great sigh of relief. I was free for a while, at least. Another episode in my life was finished. I could forget it and look forward to new things. As I rode on, the march wind got into my blood and sent it whirling madly through my veins. The sun was shining brightly and covered everything with smiles. The fruit trees were all in flower, apples, pears, almonds. The dainty buds covered the branches with a snow of pink and white. The ground beneath them was bespattered with narcissi and anemones. The very olive trees looked gay. All the world laughed with joy at the bright spring morning and I laughed louder than the rest. I drew in long breaths of the keen air, and it made me drunk, so that I set the spurs to my horse and galloped wildly along the silent road. I had made up my mind to forget Julia, and I succeeded, for the changing scenes took me away from myself, and I was intent on the world at large. But I could not command my dreams. At night she came to me, and I dreamed that she was by my side, with her arms round my neck, sweetly caressing, trying to make me forget what I had suffered. And the waking was bitter. But even that would leave me soon, I hoped, and then I should be free indeed. I rode on, full of courage and good spirits, along endless roads, putting up at wayside inns, through the mountains, past villages and hamlets, past thriving towns, till I found myself in the heart of Tuscany, and finally I saw the roofs of Florence spread out before me. After I had cleaned myself at the inn and had eaten, I sauntered through the town, renewing my recollections. I walked round Madonna del Fiore, and leaning against one of the houses at the back of the piazza, looked at the beautiful apse, the marble all glistening in the moonlight. It was very quiet and peaceful. The exquisite church filled me with a sense of rest and purity, so that I cast far from me all vice. Then I went to the baptistry and tried to make out in the dim light the details of Ghiberti's wonderful doors. It was late and the streets were silent as I strolled to the Piazza della Signoria and saw before me the grim stone palace with its tower, and I came down to the Arno and looked at the glistening of the water with the bridge covered with houses, and as I considered the beauty of it all, I thought it strange that the works of man should be so good and pure, and man himself so vile. 
Next day I set about my business. I had a special letter of introduction to Lorenzo and was ushered into him by a clerk. I found two people in the room, one, a young man with a long oval face and the bones of the face and chin very strongly marked. He had a very wonderful skin, like brown ivory, black hair that fell over his forehead and ears, and, most striking of all, large brown eyes, very soft and melancholy. I thought I had never before seen a man quite so beautiful. Seated by him, talking with animation, was an insignificant man, bent and wrinkled and mean, looking like a clerk in a cloth merchant's shop, except for the massive golden chain about his neck and the dress of dark red velvet with an embroidered collar. His features were ugly, a large, coarse nose, a heavy, sensual mouth, small eyes, but very sharp and glittering, the hair thin and short, the skin muddy, yellow, wrinkled. Lorenzo de' Medici. As I entered the room, he interrupted himself and spoke to me in a harsh, disagreeable voice. Messer Filippo Brandolini, I think, you are very welcome. I am afraid I interrupt you, I said, looking at the youth with the melancholy eyes. Oh, no, answered Lorenzo gaily. We were talking of Plato. I really ought to have been attending to very much more serious matters, but I never can resist Pico. Then that was the famous Pico della Mirandola. I looked at him again and felt envious that one person should be possessed of such genius and such beauty. It was hardly fair on nature's part. It is more the subject than I that is irresistible. Ah, the banquet, said Lorenzo, clasping his hands. What an inexhaustible matter. I could go on talking about it all day and all night for a year and then find I had left unsaid half what I had in my mind. You have so vast an experience in the subject treated of, said Pico, laughing. You could give a chapter of comment to every sentence of Plato. You rascal, Pico! answered Lorenzo, also laughing. And what is your opinion of love, Messer? he added, turning to me. I answered, smiling. Con tua promesse e tua false parole, con falsi risi et con vago sembiante donna menato a il tuo fidele amante. Ma, those promises of thine and those false words, those traitor smiles, and that inconstant seeming a lady, with these thou'st led astray thy faithful lover. They were Lorenzo's own lines, and he was delighted that I should quote them. But still, the pleasure was not too great, and I saw that it must be subtle flattery indeed that should turn his head. You have the spirit of a courtier, Messer Filippo, he said in reply to my quotation. You are wasted on liberty. It is in the air in Florence. One breathes it in through every pore. What? Liberty? No, the spirit of the courtier. Lorenzo looked at me sharply, then at Pico, repressing a smile at my sarcasm. Well, about your business from Forley, he said, but when I began explaining the transaction, he interrupted me. Oh, all that you can arrange with my secretaries. Tell me what is going on in the town. There have been rumours of disturbance. I looked at Pico, who rose and went out, saying, I will leave you. Politics are not for me. I told Lorenzo all that had happened while he listened intently, occasionally interrupting me to ask a question. When I had finished, he said, And what will happen now? I shrugged my shoulders. Who knows? The wise man knows, he said earnestly, for he has made up his mind what will happen and goes about to cause it to happen. It is only the fool who trusts to chance and waits for circumstances to develop themselves. Tell your master. I beg your pardon, I interrupted. He looked at me interrogatively. I was wondering of whom you were speaking, I murmured. He understood, and smiling said, I apologize. I was thinking you were a fall of Aze. Of course, I remember now that you are a citizen of Castello, and we all know how tenacious they have been of their liberty and how proud of their freedom. He had me on the hip, for Città di Castello 
had been among the first of the towns to lose its liberty, and unlike others, had borne its servitude with more equanimity than was honourable. However, he went on, tell Cecco Dossi that I know Girolamo Riario. It was his father and he who were the prime movers in the conspiracy which killed my brother and nearly killed myself. Let him remember that the Riario is perfectly unscrupulous and that he is not accustomed to forgive an injury or forget it. You say that Girolamo has repeatedly threatened Cecco. Has that had no effect on him? He was somewhat alarmed. Besides, I looked at him, trying to seize his meaning. Did he make up his mind to sit still and wait till Girolamo found means to carry his threats into effect? I was rather at a loss for an answer. Lorenzo's eyes were fixed keenly upon me. They seemed to be trying to read my brain. It was suggested to him that it would be unwise, I replied slowly. And what did he answer to that? He recalled the ill results of certain recent events. Ah! He took his eyes off me, as if he had suddenly seen the meaning behind my words, and was now quite sure of everything he wanted to know. He walked up and down the room, thinking. Then he said to me, Tell Cecco that Girolamo's position is very insecure. The Pope is against him, though he pretends to uphold him. You remember that when the Zampeschi seized his castle of San Marco, Girolamo thought they had the tacit consent of the Pope and dared make no reprisal. Lodovico Sforza would doubtless come to the assistance of his half-sister, but he is occupied with the Venetians, and if the people of Forli hate the Count. Then you advise... I advise nothing, but let Cecco know that it is only the fool who proposes to himself an end when he cannot or will not attain it. But the man who deserves the name of man marches straight to the goal with clearness of mind and strength of will. He looks at things as they are and puts aside all vain appearances, and when his intelligence has shown him the means to his end, he is a fool if he refuses them, and he is a wise man if he uses them steadily and unhesitatingly. Tell that to Cecco. He threw himself into his chair with a little cry of relief. Now we can talk of other things. Pico. A servant came in to say that Pico had gone away. The villain, cried Lorenzo. But I dare say you will want to go away too, Messer Brandolini. But you must come tomorrow. We are going to act the Menachini of Plautus. And besides the wit of the Latin, you will see all the youth and beauty of Florence. As I took my leave, he added, I need not warn you to be discreet. Sixteen. A few days later I found myself in sight of Forley. As I rode along I meditated, and presently the thought came to me that after all there was perhaps a certain equality in the portioning out of good and evil in this world. When fate gave one happiness, she followed it with unhappiness, but the two lasted about an equal time, so that the balance was not unevenly preserved. In my love for Julia I had gone through a few days of intense happiness. The first kiss had caused me such ecstasy that I was wrapped up to heaven. I felt myself a god, and this was followed by a sort of passive happiness when I lived, but to enjoy my love and cared for nothing in the world besides. Then came the catastrophe, and I passed through the most awful misery that man had ever felt. Even now, as I thought of it, the sweat gathered on my forehead but I noticed that strangely, as this wretchedness was equal with the first happiness, so was it equal in length, and this was followed by a passive unhappiness when I no longer felt all the bitterness of my woe, but only a certain dull misery which was like peace, and half smiling, half sighing, I thought that the passive misery again was equal to the passive happiness. Finally came the blessed state of indifference, and except for the remembrance, my heart was as if nothing had been at all. So it seemed to me that one ought not to complain, for if the world had no right to give one continual misery, one had no cause to expect unmingled happiness, and the conjunction of the two, in all things equal, seemed normal and reasonable. 
and I had not noticed that I was come to Forley. I entered the gate with a pleasant sense of homecoming. I passed along the grey streets I was beginning to know so well, and felt for them something of the affection of old friends. I was glad, too, that I should shortly see Checo and my dear Matteo. I felt I had been unkind to Matteo. He was so fond of me and had always been so good, but I had been so wrapped up in my love that his very presence had been importunate, and I had responded coldly to his friendliness. And being then in a sentimental mood, I thought how much better and more trustworthy a friend is to the most lovely woman in the world. You could neglect him and be unfaithful to him, and yet, if you were in trouble, you could come back and he would take you to his arms and comfort you, and never once complain that you had strayed away. I longed to be with Matteo, clasping his hand. In my hurry, I put the spurs to my horse and clattered along the street. In a few minutes I had reached the palazzo, leapt off my horse, sprung up the stairs, and flung myself into the arms of my friend. After the first greetings, Matteo dragged me along to Checo. The good cousin is most eager to hear your news. We must not keep him waiting. Checo seemed as pleased to see me as Matteo. He warmly pressed my hand and said, I am glad to have you back, Filippo. In your absence we have been lamenting like forsaken shepherdesses. Now what is your news? I was fully impressed with my importance at the moment and the anxiety with which I was being listened to. I resolved not to betray myself too soon and began telling them about the kindness of Lorenzo and the play which he had invited me to see. I described the brilliancy of the assembly and the excellence of the acting. They listened with interest, but I could see it was not what they wanted to hear. But I see you want to hear about more important matters, I said. Well, ah, they cried, drawing their chairs closer to me, settling themselves to listen attentively. With a slight smile, I proceeded to give them the details of the commercial transaction, which had been the ostensible purpose of my visit, and I laughed to myself as I saw their disgust. Checo could not restrain his impatience, but did not like to interrupt me. Matteo, however, saw that I was mocking and broke in. Confound you, Filippo! Why do you torment us when you know we are on pins and needles? Checo looked up and saw me laughing, and implored, Put us out of torture, for heaven's sake! Very well, I answered. Lorenzo asked me about the state of Forli, and I told him. Then, after thinking a while, he said, Tell this to Checo. And I repeated word for word what Lorenzo had said to me, and as far as I could, I reproduced his accent and gesture. When I had finished, they both sat still and silent. At last, Matteo, glancing to his cousin, said, It seems sufficiently clear. It is indeed very clear, answered Checo gravely. Seventeen. I made up my mind to amuse myself now. I was sick of being grave and serious. When one thinks how short a while youth lasts, it is foolish not to take the best advantage of it. The time man has at his disposal is not long enough for tragedy and moaning. He has only room for a little laughter, and then his hair gets grey and his knees shaky, and he is left repenting that he did not make more of his opportunities. So many people have told me that they have never regretted their vices, but often their virtues. Life is too short to take things seriously. Let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. There was really so much to do in Forley that amusement became almost hard work. There were hunting parties in which we scoured the country all day and returned at night, tired and sleepy, but with a delicious feeling of relief, stretching our limbs like giants waking from their sleep. There were excursions to villas where we would be welcomed by some kind lady and repeat on a smaller scale the Decameron of Boccaccio or imitate the learned conversations of Lorenzo and his circle at Correggio. We could platonize as well as they 
and we discovered the charm of treating impropriety from a philosophic point of view. We would set ourselves some subject and all write sonnets on it, and I noticed that the productions of our ladies were always more highly spiced than our own. Sometimes we would play at being shepherds and shepherdesses, but in this I always failed lamentably, for my nymph invariably complained that I was not as enterprising as a swain should be. Then we would act pastoral plays in the shadow of the trees. Orpheus was our favourite subject, and I was always set for the title part rather against my will, for I could never bring the proper vigour into my lament for Eurydice, since it always struck me as both unreasonable and ungallant to be so inconsolable for the loss of one love when there were all around so many to console one. And in Forley itself there was a continuous whirl of amusement, festivities of every kind crowded on one, so that one had scarcely time to sleep, from the gravity and instructive tedium of a comedy by Terence to a drinking bout or a card party. I went everywhere, and everywhere received the heartiest of welcomes. I could sing and dance and play the lute and act, and I was ready to compose a sonnet or an ode at a moment's notice. In a week I could produce a five-act tragedy in the Senecan manner, or an epic on Rinaldo or Launcelot, and as I had not a care in the world, and was as merry as a drunken friar, they opened their arms to me and gave me the best of all they had. I was attentive to all the ladies, and scandalous tongues gave me half a dozen mistresses, with details of the siege and capture. I wondered whether the amiable Julia heard the stories, and what she thought of them. Occasionally I saw her, but I did not trouble to speak to her. Forley was large enough for the two of us, and when people are disagreeable, why should you trouble your head about them? One afternoon I rode with Matteo a few miles out of Forley, to a villa where there was to be some festivity in honour of a christening. It was a beautiful spot, with fountains and shady walks, and pleasant lawns of well-mown grass, and I set myself to the enjoyment of another day. Among the guests was Claudia Piacentini. I pretended to be very angry with her, because at a ball which she had recently given, I had not received the honour of an invitation. She came to me to ask forgiveness. It was my husband, she said, which I knew perfectly well. He said he would not have you in his house. You've had another quarrel with him. How can I help it when I see him the possessor of the lovely Claudia? He says he will never be satisfied till he has your blood. I was not alarmed. He talked of making a vow never to cut his beard or his hair till he had his revenge, but I implored him not to make himself more hideous than a merciful providence had already made him. I thought of the ferocious Ercole with a long, untrimmed beard and unkempt hair falling over his face. He would have looked like a wild man of the woods, I said. I should have had to allow myself to be massacred for the good of society. I should have been one more of the martyrs of humanity, St. Philip Brandolini. I offered her my arm, suggesting a saunter through the gardens. We wandered along cool paths, bordered with myrtle and laurel and cypress trees. The air was filled with the song of birds, and a gentle breeze bore to us the scent of the spring flowers. By and by we came to a little lawn shut in by tall shrubs. In the middle a fountain was playing, and under the shadow of a chestnut tree was a marble seat supported by griffins. In one corner stood a statue of Venus framed in green bushes. We had left the throng of guests far behind, and the place was very still. The birds, as if oppressed with its beauty, had ceased to sing, and only the fountain broke the silence. The unceasing fall of water was like a lullaby in its monotony, and the air was scented with lilac. We sat down. The quiet was delightful. Peace and beauty filled one, and I felt a great sense of happiness pass into me, like some subtle liquid permeating every corner of my soul. The smell of the lilac was beginning to intoxicate me, 
and from my happiness issued a sentiment of love towards all nature. I felt as though I could stretch out my arms and embrace its impalpable spirit. The Venus in the corner gained flesh-like tints of green and yellow and seemed to be melting into life. The lilac came across to me in great waves, oppressive, overpowering. I looked at Claudia. I thought she was affected as myself. She, too, was overwhelmed by the murmur of the water, the warmth, the scented air. And I was struck again with the wonderful voluptuousness of her beauty, her mouth sensual and moist, the lips deep red and heavy. Her neck was wonderfully massive, so white that the veins showed clear and blue. Her clinging dress revealed the fullness of her form, its undulating curves. She seemed some goddess of sensuality. As I looked at her, I was filled with a sudden blind desire to possess her. I stretched out my arms, and she, with a cry of passion, like an animal, surrendered herself to my embrace. I drew her to me and kissed her beautiful mouth sensual and moist, her lips deep red and heavy. We sat side by side looking at the fountain, breathing in the scented air. When can I see you? I whispered. Tomorrow, after midnight. Come into the little street behind my house, and a door will be open to you. Claudia, goodbye. You must not come back with me now. We have been away so long. People would notice us. Wait here a while after me, and then there will be no fear. Goodbye. She left me, and I stretched myself on the marble seat, looking at the little rings which the drops made as they fell on the water. My love for Julia was indeed finished now, dead, buried, and a stone Venus erected over it as only sign of its existence. I tried to think of a suitable inscription. Time could kill the most obstinate love, and a beautiful woman, with the breezes of spring to help her, could carry away even the remembrance. I felt that my life was now complete. I had all pleasures imaginable at my beck and call, good wines to drink, good foods to eat, nice clothes, games, sports and pastimes, and last of all the greatest gift the gods can make, a beautiful woman to my youth and strength. I had arrived at the summit of wisdom, the point aimed at by the wise man to take the day as it comes, seizing the pleasures, avoiding the disagreeable, enjoying the present, and giving no thought to the past or future. That, I said to myself, is the highest wisdom, never to think, for the way of happiness is to live in one's senses as the beasts, and like the ox, chewing the cud, use the mind only to consider one's superiority to the rest of mankind. I laughed a little as I thought of my tears and cries when Julia left me. It was not a matter worth troubling about. All I should have said to myself was that I was a fool not to abandon her before she abandoned me. Poor Julia, I quite frightened her in the vehemence of my rage. The following evening I would not let Matteo go to bed. You must keep me company, I said. I am going out at one. Very well, he said, if you will tell me where you're going. Ah, no, that is a secret, but I am willing to drink her health with you. Without a name? Yes. To the nameless one, then, and good luck. Then, after a little conversation, he said, I am glad you have suffered no more from Julia Dal Asti. I was afraid... Oh, these things pass off. I took your advice and found the best way to console myself was to fall in love with somebody else. Yeah. There was a little excitement in going to this mysterious meeting. I wondered whether it was a trap arranged by the amiable Urkeli to get me in his power and rid himself of my unpleasant person. But faint heart never won fair lady, and even if he set on me with two or three others, I should be able to give a reasonable account of myself, but there had been nothing to fear. On my way home, as the day was breaking, I smiled to myself at the matter-of-fact way in which a woman had opened the little door and shown me into the room Claudia had told me of. 
She was evidently well used to her business. She did not even take the trouble to look into my face to see who was the newcomer. I wondered how many well-cloaked gallants she had let in by the same door. I did not care if they were half a hundred. I did not suppose the beautiful Claudia was more virtuous than myself. Suddenly it occurred to me that I had revenged myself on Ercole Piacentini at last, and the quaint thought, coming unexpectedly, made me stop dead and burst into a shout of laughter. The thought of that hangdog visage and the beautiful ornaments I had given him was enough to make a dead man merry. Oh, it was a fairer revenge than any I could have dreamed of, but besides that, I was filled with a great sense of pleasure because I was at last free. I felt that if some slight chain still bound me to Julia now, even that was broken and I had recovered my liberty. There was no love this time. There was a great desire for the magnificent sensual creature with the lips deep red and heavy, but it left my mind free. I was now again a complete man, and this time I had no nemesis to fear. 18. And so my life went on for a little while, filled with pleasure and amusement. I was contented with my lot and had no wish for change. The time went by, and we reached the first week in April. Girolamo had organized a great ball to celebrate the completion of his palace. He had started living in it as soon as there were walls and roof, but he had spent years on the decorations, taking into his service the best artists he could find in Italy. And now, at last, everything was finished. The Orsi had been invited with peculiar cordiality, and on the night we betook ourselves to the palace. We walked up the stately staircase, a masterpiece of architecture, and found ourselves in the enormous hall which Girolamo had designed especially for gorgeous functions. It was ablaze with light. At the further end, on a low stage, led up to by three broad steps, under a dais on high-backed golden chairs, sat Girolamo and Caterina Sforza. Behind them, in a semicircle, and on the steps at each side, were the ladies of Caterina's suite, and a number of gentlemen, at the back, standing like statues, a row of men-at-arms. It is almost regal, said Cecco, pursing up his lips. It is not so poor a thing to be the Lord of Forley, answered Matteo. Fuel to the fire. We approached, and Girolamo, as he saw us, rose and came down the steps. Hail, my Cecco, he said, taking both his hands. Till you had come, the assembly was not complete. Matteo and I went to the Countess. She had surpassed herself this night. Her dress was of cloth of silver, shimmering and sparkling. In her hair were diamonds shining like fireflies in the night. Her arms, her neck, her fingers glittered with costly gems. I had never seen her look so beautiful, nor so magnificent. Let them say what they liked, Cecco and Matteo and the rest of them, but she was born to be a queen. How strange that this offspring of the rough condottiere and the lewd woman should have a majesty such as one imagines of a mighty empress descended from countless kings. She took the trouble to be particularly gracious to us. Me, she complimented on some verses she had seen, and was very flattering in reference to a pastoral play which I had arranged. She could not congratulate my good Matteo on any intellectual achievements, but the fame of his amours gave her a subject on which she could playfully reproach him. She demanded details, and I left her listening intently to some history which Matteo was whispering in her ear, and I knew he was not particular in what he said. I felt in peculiarly high spirits, and I looked about for someone on whom to vent my good humour. I caught sight of Julia. I had seen her once or twice since my return to Forley, but had never spoken to her. Now I felt sure of myself. I knew I did not care two straws for her, but I thought it would please me to have a little revenge. I looked at her a moment. I made up my mind. I went to her and bowed most ceremoniously. Donna Julia, behold the moth. I had used the simile before, but not to her, so it did not matter. She looked at me undecidedly, not quite knowing how to take me. 
May I offer you my arm? I said, as blandly as I could. She smiled a little awkwardly and took it. How beautiful the Countess is tonight, I said. Everyone will fall in love with her. I knew she hated Katerina, a sentiment which the great lady returned with vigour. I would not dare say it to another, but I know you are never jealous. She is indeed like the moon among the stars. The idea does not seem too new, she said coldly. It is all the more comprehensible. I am thinking of writing a sonnet on the theme. I imagined it had been done before, but the ladies of Forley will doubtless be grateful to you. She was getting cross, and I knew by experience that when she was cross, she always wanted to cry. I am afraid you are angry with me, I said. No, it is you who are angry with me, she answered rather tearfully. I? Why should you think that? You have not forgiven me for— I wondered whether the conscientious Giorgio had had another attack of morality and ridden off into the country. My dear lady, I said with a little laugh, I assure you that I have forgiven you entirely. After all, it was not such a very serious matter. No? She looked at me with a little surprise. I shrugged my shoulders. You were quite right in what you did. Those things have to finish some time or other, and it really does not so much matter when. I was afraid I had hurt you, she said in a low voice. The scene came to my mind, the dimly lit room, the delicate form lying on the couch, cold and indifferent, while I was given over to an agony of despair. I remembered the glitter of the jeweled ring against the white hand. I would have no mercy. My dear Julia, you will allow me to call you Julia. She nodded. My dear Julia, I was a little unhappy at first, I acknowledge, but one gets over those things so quickly, a bottle of wine and a good sleep. They are like bleeding to a fever. You are unhappy? Naturally, one is always rather put out when one is dismissed. One would prefer to have done the breaking oneself. It was a matter of pride. I am afraid I must confess to it. I did not think so at the time. I laughed. Oh, that is my excited way of putting things. I frightened you, but it did not really mean anything. She did not answer. After a while I said, You know, when one is young, one should make the most of one's time. Fidelity is a stupid virtue, unphilosophical and extremely unfashionable. What do you mean? Simply this. You did not particularly love me, and I did not particularly love you. Oh. We had a passing fancy for one another, and that satisfied there was nothing more to keep us together. We should have been very foolish not to break the chain. If you had not done so, I should have. With your woman's intuition, you saw that and forestalled me. Again, she did not answer. Of course, if you had been in love with me or I with you, it would have been different. But as it was... I see my cousin Violante in the corner there. Will you lead me to her? I did as she asked, and as she was bowing me my dismissal, I said, We have had a very pleasant talk, and we are quite good friends, are we not? Quite, she said. I drew a long breath as I left her. I hoped I had hurt. I hoped I had humiliated her. I wished I could have thought of things to say that would have cut her to the heart. I was quite indifferent to her, but when I remembered, I hated her. I knew everyone in Forley by now, and as I turned away from Julia, I had no lack of friends with whom to talk. The rooms became more crowded every moment. The assembly was the most brilliant that Forley had ever seen, and as the evening wore on, the people became more animated. A babel of talk drowned the music, and the chief topic of conversation was the wonderful beauty of Katerina. She was bubbling over with high spirits. No one knew what had happened to make her so joyful, for of late she had suffered a little from the unpopularity of her husband, and a sullen look of anger had replaced the old smiles and graces. But tonight she was herself again. 
Men were standing round talking to her, and one heard a shout of laughter from them as every now and then she made some witty repartee, and her conversation gained another charm from a sort of soldierly bluntness which people remembered in Francesco Sforza and which she had inherited. People also spoke of the cordiality of Girolamo towards Arcecco. He walked up and down the room with him, arm in arm, talking affectionately. It reminded the onlookers of the time when they had been as brothers together. Caterina occasionally gave them a glance and a little smile of approval. She was evidently well pleased with the reconciliation. I was making my way through the crowd, watching the various people, giving a word here and there or a nod, and I thought that life was really a very amusing thing. I felt mightily pleased with myself, and I wondered where my good friend Claudia was. I must go and pay her my respects. Filippo! I turned and saw Scipione Morettini standing by his sister, with a number of gentlemen and ladies, most of them known to me. Why are you smiling so contentedly? he said. You look as if you had lost a pebble and found a diamond in its place. Perhaps I have. Who knows? At that moment, I saw Ercole Piacentini enter the room with his wife. I wondered why they were so late. Claudia was at once seized upon by one of her admirers and, leaving her husband, sauntered off on the proffered arm. Ercole came up the room on his way to the Count. His grim visage was contorted into an expression of amiability which sat on him with an ill grace. This is indeed a day of rejoicing, I said. Even the wicked ogre is trying to look pleasant. Julia gave a little silvery laugh. I thought it forced. You have a forgiving spirit, dear friend, she said, accenting the last word in recollection of what I had said to her. A truly Christian disposition. Why? I asked, smiling. I admire the way in which you have forgiven Ercole for the insults he has offered you. One does not often find a gentleman who so charitably turns his other cheek to the smiter. I laughed within myself. She was trying to be even with me. I was glad to see that my darts had taken good effect. Scipione interposed, for what his sister had said was sufficiently bitter. Nonsense, Julia, he said. You know Filippo is the last man to forgive his enemies until the breath is well out of their bodies, but circumstances... Julia pursed up her lips into an expression of contempt. Circumstances. I was surprised, because I remembered the vigour with which Messer Filippo had vowed to revenge himself. Oh, but Messer Filippo considers that he has revenged himself very effectively. I said. How? There are more ways of satisfying one's honour than by cutting a hole in a person's chest. What do you mean, Filippo? said Scipione. Did you not see as he passed? Ercole, what? Did you not see the adornment of his noble head, the elegant pair of horns? They looked at me, not quite understanding. Then I caught sight of Claudia, who was standing close to us. Ah, I see the diamond I have found in place of the pebble I have lost. I pray you excuse me. Then, as they saw me walk towards Claudia, they understood, and I heard a burst of laughter. I took my lady's hand, and bowing deeply, kissed it with the greatest fervour. I glanced at Julia from the corner of my eyes, and saw her looking down on the ground, with a deep blush of anger on her face. My heart leapt for joy to think, that I had returned something of the agony she had caused me. The evening grew late, and the guests began to go. Cecco, as he passed me, asked, Are you ready? Yes, I said, accompanying him to Girolamo and the Countess to take our leave. You are very unkind, Cecco, said the Countess. You have not come near me the whole evening. You have been so occupied, he answered. But I am not now, she replied, smiling. The moment I saw you free, I came to you. To say goodbye. It is very late. No, surely. Sit down and talk to me. Cecco did as he was bid, and I, seeing he meant to stay longer, sauntered off again in search of friends. 
the conversation between Checo and the Countess was rather hindered by the continual leave-takings as the people began to go away rapidly, in groups. I sat myself down in a window with Matteo, and we began comparing notes of our evening. He told me of a new love to whom he had discovered his passion for the first time. Fair wind, foul wind, I asked, laughing. She pretended to be very angry, he said, but she allowed me to see that if the worst came to the worst, she would not permit me to break my heart. I looked out into the room and found that everyone had gone, except Ercole Piacentini, who was talking to the Count in undertones. I am getting so sleepy, said Matteo. We went forward to the Countess, who said, as she saw us come, Go away, Matteo. I will not have you drag Checo away yet. We have been trying to talk to one another for the last half hour, and now that we have the chance at last, I refuse to be disturbed. I would not for worlds rob Checo of such pleasure, said Matteo, adding to me, as we retired to our window, what a nuisance having to wait for one's cousin while a pretty woman is flirting with him. You have me to talk to? What more can you want? I don't want to talk to you at all, he answered, laughing. Girolamo was still with Ercoli. His mobile eyes were moving over the room, hardly ever resting on Ercoli's face, but sometimes on us, more often on Cecco. I wondered whether he was jealous. At last Cecco got up and said good night. Then Girolamo came forward. You are not going yet, he said. I want to speak with you on the subject of those taxes. It was the first time he had mentioned them. It is getting so late, said Cecco, and these good gentlemen are tired. They can go home, really. It is very urgent. Cecco hesitated and looked at us. We will wait for you, said Matteo. Girolamo's eyes moved about here and there, never resting a moment, from Cecco to me, from me to Matteo, and on to his wife, and then on again, with extraordinary rapidity. It was quite terrifying. One would think you were afraid of leaving Cecco in our hands, said the Countess, smiling. No, returned Matteo but I look forward to having some of your attention now that Cecco is otherwise occupied. Will you let me languish? She laughed, and a rapid glance passed between her and the Count. I shall be only too pleased, she said. Come and sit by me, one on each side. The Count turned to Ercoli. Well, good night, my friend, he said. Good night. Ercoli left us, and Girolamo, taking Cecco's arm, walked up and down the room, speaking. The Countess and Matteo commenced a gay conversation. Although I was close to them, I was left alone, and I watched the Count. His eyes fascinated me, moving ceaselessly. What could be behind them? What could be the man's thoughts that his eyes should never rest? They enveloped the person they looked at, his head, every feature of his face, his body, his clothes. One imagined... There was no detail they had not caught. It was as if they ate into the very soul of the man. The two men tramped up and down, talking earnestly. I wondered what they were saying. At last, Girolamo stopped. Ah, well, I must have mercy on you. I shall tire you to death. And you know, I do not wish to do anything to harm you. Cecco smiled. Whatever difficulty there has been between us, Cecco, you know that there has never on my part been any ill feeling towards you. I have always had for you a very sincere and affectionate friendship. And as he said the words, an extraordinary change came over him. The eyes, the mobile eyes, stopped still at last. For the first time I saw them perfectly steady, motionless, like glass. They looked fixedly into Cecco's eyes without winking, and their immobility was as strange as their perpetual movement, and to me it was more terrifying. It was as if Girolamo was trying to see his own image in Cecco's soul. We bade them farewell, and together issued out into the silence of the night, and I felt that behind us the motionless eyes, like glass, 
were following us into the darkness.